First, sorry about the text-to-speech narration for this video, I used it as I don't have a microphone. Ok, on to the story of my 1979 450SL, I purchased it back in 2010, after seeing it advertised on eBay as an MOT fail. No one bid on it so I contacted the owner and agreed a price of £4,500 if he could get it through an MOT. A few days later I was flying down to Portsmouth to make the purchase. The condition of the car was worse than it had appeared in the pictures, but I went ahead with the purchase anyway then drove it back home to Dunfermline. This is what the car looked like after the 470 mile trip back home. The condition looked okay with a rust bubble by one of the windscreen wiper stalks, as well as a few on the boot lid. Under the bonnet things did not look so good, I could see from the yellow pen markings that this was not the original engine. The paperwork that came with the car showed it had been swapped out a few years earlier. After thorough cleaning it did not look so bad. One of the first jobs I did was to fit new downpipes as the original ones were holed with poor quality repairs. After the alloys were refurbished and the car had been given a careful detail, it was starting to look pretty good, especially from a few meters away. As winter arrived and I took the car off the road I decided to investigate a ticking sound from the rear of the engine. After removing the valve cover I could tell from the color of the heads that these parts had been through a parts washer fairly recently, it was all very clean. Unbelievably the oil tube that provides oil to the camshaft bearings had been glued in place with some kind of sealant rather than new plastic clips being used. The end result of this was that the tube had worked loose at the rear of the camshaft and wasn't supplying the two rear bearings with oil. Once the head bolts were out, I tried to lift the head off using the camshaft. I could immediately feel the camshaft move inside the bearings. Once I priced up replacement parts and head work, which came to around £1,000, I decided to scrap the engine and look for a replacement. I pulled out the old engine and transmission and found a 1980 450 engine with 97,000 miles on the clock, a few days later on eBay. This was very lucky as they are very rare. There are only around 134 50 SL cars still registered on the roads in the UK now. Two days later the beast was delivered. With the engine out I had the opportunity to clean up the engine bay and fit new engine mounts. You can see how much the old ones had been compressed. I then painted the slam panel using rattle cans. As well as the brake booster with brake fluid resistant paint. A few days later the new engine was fitted in and hooked up. The engine felt very strong and gave a 060 time of 7.5 seconds. The MOT highlighted a number of holes in the floor pans and underbody. Front right. The left side was worse. Repair to the right side. And left. There were also a few other small welding repairs carried out at the same time. The repairs were made by a local welder and were done very cheaply. I was happy with them at the time, but later, I would change my mind. The center console was badly faded and had turned pink, so I repainted it with color bond vinyl paint. The final result was very good and was hard wearing. The leather seats were also worn and faded, there was also a tear in the leather on the driver's seat. The first job was then to strip the seats using cellulose thinners and a scotch bright pad to remove as much of the old sealant and dye as possible. You can see the rip in the leather more clearly in this picture. I glued in a mesh patch to support the leather, and repaired with a flexible filler material from the furniture clinic. Once the filler was dry it could be sanded, then the seats could be re-dyed and sealed with polyurethane. This is how the front seats looked once completed, I also carried out the same process on the rear seats. When refitting everything back into the car, I dyed the wood panels a darker shade, and fitted a new gear shift knob and leather steering wheel. After washing, paint correction and waxing, the car looked great again. In the summer of 2011, we had a road trip to the Cotswolds. The car looked and performed perfectly. Towards the end of 2011, 
I heard a loud clacking sound from the engine at startup, I immediately stopped the engine and investigated. This is what I found, a broken chain guide. Luckily I was able to remove it with some long nose pliers. Broken guides and chain stretch are a known weakness on these engines so I set about replacing both, even though the chain looked fairly new. New guides fitted. Feeding the new chain into the engine. New chain fed through with new guides, along with a new chain tensioner. Both door seals were also perished, both of these were also replaced. I was able to pick up new door seals and drive shafts on a business trip to the US, they were much cheaper over there, and I was able to smuggle them home in my luggage. Both door seals were fitted at the time but the new drive shaft didn't get fitted for a further 7 years. Into 2012 and it was time to move on my 10 year old TT, which I had owned for 8 years, and replace it with another 10 year old car. The TT was replaced with the XK8 which also ended up needing a lot of work done to it. Winter 2012, and it was time to sort out the rear bumper, there were rust bubbles coming through the chrome parts on both sides. This is how the bumper looked once it was removed and stripped down. The two side chrome parts and the inner stiffeners were beyond repair. I was able to source a combination of second hand chromes and new old stock stiffeners on eBay. Before reassembly, all the parts were painted with epoxy primer to prevent further corrosion. Assembled and ready to go back on the car, but before that, I did a quick check for rust on the body behind the bumper mounting areas. This area didn't look too good. After a bit of grinding, it looked like this. It was time to learn to weld myself. I wanted to make good quality repairs, that would be more seamless, than the quick and dirty repairs in the foot wells. Paying someone else to do the welding on the car to the standard I wanted would cost too much. My first attempts were not too good but the more I did the better I became. I purchased this cheap MIG welder on Gumtree and have used it ever since. This is what was left after all the rust was cut out. I made up two car templates, for the new parts I needed, then cut the shapes out of steel sheet. This shows the first part welded in place. The second part, cut out, and folded into shape. Welded into place before grinding. I also needed to fabricate a new bumper bracket. This is how it looked once welded into place in the boot. Finally the area was painted with epoxy primer, and the bumper was refitted to the car. Two years later, I decided it was time to address the rust bubbles on the boot lid, and the other defects around the rear of the car. I purchased a second-hand boot lid on eBay. It had holes along the rear edge where a spoiler had been fitted, but there were no signs of any rust. It was easy enough to weld up the holes and grind them back. The next job was to strip off all the old paint, I used a chemical paint stripper which was slow and messy. I would later find out it is easier to grind it off with a poly disc. After filling and flatting, it was ready for epoxy primer. Rather than rely upon a paint shop, I decided to buy the necessary spray equipment, and PPE, and learn how to spray paint myself. I watched a lot of YouTube videos by, the gunman, and practiced on the inside of the boot lid. This is the boot lid, after epoxy primer and 2K top coat, I was pleased with the results. The top side, was painted with two coats of epoxy primer then three coats of high build primer, before being flattened back, then three of base coat, and finally two coats of 2K clear. Next, I stripped off the bumper, rear lights, the boot lid seal, and the soft top compartment cover. There were a few areas of damaged paint, like this, that needed attention. They were sanded, and filled. This was more problematic, paint bubbles at the top of the wheel arch. I cut out a section, to see what the problem was. After cleaning up the area, I cut out a new section, and tacked it in place. Then after grinding, and finally filling, and sanding, more welding was needed, round the boot lid, opening. 
Another section, tacked in place. Grinding done. This area was also perforated. Cut out, and rust cleaned up. Water from the soft top area drains in here, a bad part of the car's design. The area was then painted, and a new repair panel, let in. Once all the repair work was complete, the car was sanded and then masked up. Two coats of epoxy were applied, and then three coats of high build, before being flatted back. Next, three coats of base, and two of clear. New rubber seals were used for the boot, and soft top cover lids. They were glued in place with PU sealant rather than contact cement. Defects on the soft top lid, were corrected. Then primed, and painted. The leather on the soft top cover had also faded, see the middle section, so I purchased some new leather, and used the old parts as a template. Once sewn together, I coated it with a polyurethane sealant. Boot lid, and soft top lid refitted. The last part of this effort, was to strip, and clean, the rear light clusters. Once complete, the rear end, looked very good. One year later, it was time to look at the front end of the car. These rust bubbles had appeared on the top of the wing a few years earlier. This is what it looked like, once I cut it open, some time later, once the wing had been removed. This is a new OEM wing. It has much better protection in this area, than the original one. I primed it with epoxy, and high build, before flatting it. Base coat. Then 2K clear coat. It would transpire, that this new wing, wouldn't get fitted, for a further three years. At the end of 2016, I planned to fit the new wing I had painted earlier in the year. The first task was to remove, and inspect, the front bumper. Once disassembled, I could see the inner stiffeners were badly corroded. After sandblasting, they looked even worse. However, to save money, I decided to repair them. First. I welded in patches into the holes. Then used a piece of angle bar, that I slotted, to form a new lip. Then welded it in place. All the parts were then painted with epoxy. Reassembled. I fitted new rubber parts, as the old ones were scored from minor bumps by previous owners. After removing the old wing, I could see various rust spots as well as numerous old poor quality repairs. It was then, that I decided not to fit the new wing, but instead, carry out a complete restoration, on all parts of the car that had not yet been worked on. It was November 1, 2016, I thought the work would take me approximately one year, I was wrong, it wouldn't be until July 2019 that I would drive the car again. I started stripping off all the old rubber under seal using a wire wheel and angle grinder. It was a slow, dirty, and laborious job. Once the passenger footwell area was stripped, I could see evidence of the many repairs that had been carried out there. I could also see that a silk cap had been welded on, over the top of the old sill. I started cutting out all the rust. This is what was left once all the rot was cut out. I also removed part of the sill, to allow me to weld in a new jacking tube. This is all that was left of the jacking tube, which was welded between the inner and outer sill. Luckily I was able to get access to a lathe, to turn for new tubes. New and old, you can see how much had rusted away. I started to rebuild the structural fabric of the inner sill using 2mm angle bar. Welded in place. Next, I welded in sections on the floor pan. Then the jacking tube. Next, more the rusting and then epoxy paint. The outer sill was then welded back in place, and welded to the jacking tube. The final pieces of the foot well, and cylind cap, were welded in place. Epoxy primer, and polyurethane seam sealer, applied to the repair panels.
Next, I had to make the same sort of repairs to the rear of the sill. This picture shows what was left, after all the rust was cut out. This is the front of the driver's side sill. And finally, the rear of the driver's side sill. The repairs to all these sections were similar, so I will only show a couple of pictures. This is the driver's side rear, mostly rebuilt. Then completed. My goal was to make the welds invisible, to the casual viewer, once repainted. Back to the near side inner wing, there were a few other patches that needed to be welded. The first patch behind the ignition module. Then the area for the power steering cooler pipes, I would recut the openings later. To get access to strip all of the underseal I needed to drop the subframe, so adapted, then fitted my engine support bar. I was then able to drop the subframe, and grind off the remainder of the underseal. Once stripped, and all the welding was complete, it looked like this. Next, primer. Then a rubberized stone chip was sprayed on, I had also fitted six studs round the wheelhouse so that I could later fit, wheel arch liners. Finally this corner was complete, after I had brushed on two coats, of 2K solid paint. The sill was stripped. Primed and sprayed with stone chip then sprayed with 2K solid dark gray. Before moving on to the driver's side, I decided to fit braces, across both doors. Once the driver's side wing was off, I could see that even more repair work was needed on this side. This is how it looked once the welding was complete. Then after priming, stone chip, and paint. By now, I was wanting a virtual nuts and bolts restoration, so decided to strip and restore the front suspension. These are the new bushes and ball joints purchased for the front end, new bearings were also purchased. The subframe and suspension were stripped and cleaned. Next I knocked the bearing shells out of the hubs. The axle carriers polished up well with the wire wheel. After a few days the remainder of the parts came back from the sandblasters. All the parts were then painted with epoxy, and 2K black. Then rebuilt, on the bench, ready to be lifted back into the car. Bolted back in place. Bearings packed with grease. And fitted in the hubs. Then fitted onto the axles with the new brake discs. The car was finally rolling again. Although I had refurbished the seats a few years earlier, as they were not very comfortable for long journeys, I decided to swap them out for seats from an Audi TT. I did not want to make any permanent changes, so that the old seats could easily be fitted back in, so I made up a pair of these frames which would accept the TT seats. These could then be unbolted to allow the original seats to be refitted. This shows how the frames are bolted to the seats. The TT seats fitted in place. Another task that had to be done, was to remove and refurbish, the dashboard as it had also faded. Once the dash was out it was possible to remove the heater box. The heater box needed to be broken down to repair all of its flapped seals. You can see in this picture, how the foam seals had started to disintegrate. All the parts stripped down, ready for cleaning. Once restored and rebuilt it looked like this. I changed the routing of the heater matrix feed pipes so that I could add in a new electronically controlled water valve. I also split down the heater blower, and replaced the motor. Cleaned and rebuilt with the new motor. This is the area where the heater box is fitted, with a view through to the bulkhead area where the motor is fitted. This is the heater blower plenum. The rust could have been much worse, just a couple of studs snapped off. Cleaned up with a grinder. New studs welded in, and painted with epoxy paint. These paint bubbles had been on the car since I bought it, the rust had spread up from one of the windscreen trim clips which are riveted in place. After grinding. This area was too far gone, and needed to be cut out. The rust cut out. Then welded up. 
The car was originally fitted with Zebrano veneer, which I didn't like, so I opted to strip it all off and replace it with a walnut veneer. I soaked the smaller parts in solvent for a few days, then used a chisel to strip the wood from the aluminium backing pieces. The larger parts were stripped with a chisel. Then they were sanded smooth. These were the veneer sheets I chose. The veneers were glued to each of the parts under pressure. Then trimmed and sanded. The gear shift main part, before varnishing. Next, I moved on to painting the main dashboard. And the center console. The dashboard had a strip of felt stitched along the edge that rubs against the windscreen, this had disintegrated. Luckily my wife volunteered to sew on a new strip using a leather needle and pliers. Almost done. The air vents and veneer strips were then reattached to the dash. This shows the veneer parts fitted to the center console, after varnishing. The headlights were not in perfect condition so I stripped them to refurbish. One of the bowls was badly corroded, so I sent it to a specialist in Germany to be re-silvered. It came back, in amazing, perfect condition. Next I painted the frames, then rebuilt them with new adjuster parts, and seals. This shows a comparison between standard, and Philips Extreme Vision bulbs, that I upgraded to. Next, I returned to the rear of the car, the prop shaft was removed first. Subframe and suspension, supported on my scissor jack. Spring compressor used to remove the springs. Subframe and diff pulled out from beneath the car. A few hours later, and it was completely disassembled. After sandblasting, the parts looked like they were in great condition. These are the new bearings and bushes that needed to be fitted. After painting the parts looked perfect. This yoke is part of the anti-squat mechanism for the rear suspension. It rides on the rear of the hub carrier and connects the lower control arm to the brake caliper. The old bearings were in poor shape, so I pulled them out before finding out that the new ones were 500 pounds each from Mercedes. Luckily I was able to find an alternative supply for about 20 pounds each. This shows the anti-squat yoke, pressed onto the hub carrier. The hub carrier connects to the lower control arm with the spindle and bearing, the other end bolts to the anti-roll bar. Starting to reassemble the rear end. I noticed that I had an LSD, the clutch packs can be seen on the right of the picture. Assembled and almost ready to go back onto the car. It was now time to drain the remainder of the fuel from the tank, and examine the fuel pump as well as the fuel and brake lines. This is the old fuel pump, filter and accumulator. I cleaned up the brackets in citric acid and then repainted them. It all looked a lot better after reassembly, with a new filter and accumulator, and hoses. I also decided to pull out the fuel tank, to get access to, and then replace the old perished hoses. The rear end of the fuel send and return lines were corroded, after removing one of the down pipes I was able to wriggle the fuel lines out of the engine bay and out of the car. This shows how bad the corrosion had become on the fuel send line. I repaired the damaged parts with 8mm Kuna fur, and compression fittings. The lines were then stripped, cleaned, and repainted with epoxy. The rear of the spare wheel well was very soft, it was only held together by the rubber under seal beneath. The rust was cut out. Then new metal welded in. The next part was the worst five days spent on the car during the entire restoration. Hot, filthy and, exhausting work. First the rear suspension area and wheel wells were stripped back to bare metal. Then the entire floor pan. This was the result after, priming with epoxy, spraying with rubber under seal, and brushing with 2K top coat. The old exhaust heat shields had disintegrated. I was able to buy these second hand, then strip and high temperature paint them. Painted and fitted to the floor. Hand brake cable and, 
new brake lines formed and painted. The brake and fuel line clips were also stripped and then repainted, before fitting the lines back onto the car. Fuel pump assembly refitted. Diff and suspension lifted back into place. Bolted back to the car, with hubs still to be fitted. Hub carrier, hub, brake back plate and anti-squat yoke reassembled. Then bolted to the lower control arm with drive shaft inserted. Brake discs and calipers fitted. New brake hoses fitted. The last job was to refit the entire roll bar, then the rear end was complete. Before fitting the new windscreen, I prepped the surrounding area for paint. Epoxy primer first. Then base coat and clear. The new windscreen arrived from Germany. Before fitting the windscreen, I started to rebuild the interior. First the heater box was refitted, it's too large to go in fully assembled, instead, it has to be slotted in in three parts then clipped together. To improve the heating system, I replaced the heater resistors for the blower with an electronic PWM module that runs cold, and fitted a proportional water valve to control the hot water flow through the matrix. I decided to delete the radio and instead, fit a Bluetooth amp, so that all media would be controlled by my phone, this is the tiny digital amp that I fitted behind the dashboard. Next the dash was fitted in place. Then the windscreen, before final fitting of the dash. Then the center console. And the rear seats. I was able to wash the carpets rather than go to the expense of buying new ones. They came out clean and usable. The carpets refitted. Power sub, fitted to complement the small dash speakers. Finally the seats could be fitted. Onto the boot. I purchased some red carpet and recovered the bulkhead between the boot and fuel tank. And also cut out a new floor mat. Next I painted the sill tops and A pillars. Then glued the new tread plates in place. Time to fit the new Nardi steering wheel. I had this old windbreaker that had been damaged and repaired years earlier, I decided to convert it to clear perspex. Marking out the perspex sheet. Creating new brackets to support the perspex screen. After cutting out, fitting, and polishing the edges, it looked very professionally made. I decided to also do a little bit of an engine tidy up. I blasted the cam covers in this vapor blast cabinet. They came up well after a polish. I also bought a set of new injectors and seats. As there is no easy way of testing the flow rate and spray pattern of the old ones. After fitting and then setting the mixture screw I was able to set the CO to the target value of 1%. This go no go gauge is used to check to see if the hydraulic lifters are working and compensating for the wear of the cam, rockers and valve. The slot on the shaft just above the brown part shows the allowable variation when checked in the engine. The gauge is fitted over the lifter and the rocker arm. If the top of the body of the gauge sits within the slot on the shaft then all is in spec. If the slot is too high or too low, then these pucks can be changed to thicker or thinner parts which sit between the top of the valve stem and the rocker arm. At the same time as checking these I decided to fit new valve stem seals. I used the rope method to hold the valves in place. 6 feet of rope and turn the engine towards TDC. This hook tool allows the valve springs to be compressed. I modified it a bit to work better on this engine. It hooks round the camshaft and then pushed down on the top of the spring cap, the rocker can then be lifted out. Once the spring is compressed, the collets can be retrieved with a magnet. Once released the springs can then be lifted out. Old valve stem seal pulled off with pliers. You can see the top of the copper valve guide in this picture. New valve stem seal pushed in place. Doing this stopped the puff of smoke I used to get at startup. You can see, three paint defects on this door, they are not scratches, 
they are actually cracks where the last paint job split open. I didn't want to paint on top of this bad substrate so decided to strip back to bare metal. I use the poly disc and angle grinder to strip off the paint. Prime the inner edges. Then door skin with my normal epoxy and then high build. Inner edges painted first. Flatted back, then base coat and clear. Hand sanded with 1500 grit wet and dry, then 3000 grit on the DA. Then used a cutting compound, with the rotary polisher to get a perfect finish. That was a hot day and a beer was in order. Then on to the other door for the same process. I then sanded and polished the wing I painted back in 2016. Finally it was fitted three years after being painted. Hinges painted. Doors refitted with new vapor checks. Then the door cars were fitted and given a good clean. The offside wing was still usable, and didn't have any rust above the headlight, so just needed painting. Primed then flatted. And painted. Once refitted, the car was starting to look almost complete. The last part to be painted was the bonnet, it was another big and dirty job to strip the paint. It left the back of the house in a mess by the time it was fully stripped. All ready for paint. House hosed down before Kim got home. Primed, but not painted, I wanted a perfect job on the bonnet but by now, late June, there were too many small flies and fluff blowing in from the nearby fields to paint in my garage, so I dropped it off at the local body shop. While I was waiting I cleaned up the engine bay. I had to fit a new distributor cap, it had been almost impossible to restart after I had washed the engine bay. Refitted the front bumper. I bought a new exhaust system. Then painted it with high temperature paint, and cured it with a hot air gun. Fitting it single handed was tricky. I fitted new coolant and wiper fluid bottles. And new wheel arch liners. I then took delivery of a set of reconditioned steel wheels and new tires. The bonnet finally came back from the painters, I had supplied the paint so it was a perfect match. Grill fitted. Next tire I painted the second hand hub caps I had purchased. Masked up and painted, that was the very last job that needed to be done. It was complete. Nearly three years since I took it off the road and approximately 3,000 hours of work. After passing the MOT test with no advisories, we went out for our first drive up to the picturesque Dollar Glen, the car ran perfectly and got lots of compliments along the way, I hope this story shows what can be done with a, bottom of the market car by almost anyone. Before purchasing it. I had only ever done very basic car maintenance such as brake pad and oil changes. This shows what can be done by anyone who is a bit handy with tools, but has no experience of car restoration. What you need most of all is self-belief and perseverance. Good luck with your next project.